Today, I'd like to talk to you about what I think is the most interesting, the most exciting, and the most fascinating industry in the world. Now, it's been flying under the radar for a little while, but it's starting to attract some really big headlines, trillions of dollars in investment, and it's projected for explosive growth. Now is really the time to get involved. I think it's going to define the next 50 years. What is this miracle industry? Government! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so I know what you're thinking. I slightly tricked you there because government is not cool or sexy. Well, I think it is. I think it's fascinating. And I'm interested in how we do government differently and better. In particular, I'm interested in how we take the experiences of people who really need government and build them into the way we design government services. Now, that's not a new idea. Abraham Lincoln was talking about government by the people, of the people, for the people, way back when. But having spent 10 years working in and around government, it's my experience that we've drifted quite a long way from that. So for us, the kind of interactions that we have with government tend to be things like going to the DMV, or registering with the IRS, or going through TSA processes, or perhaps US immigration. And I'm willing to bet that these are not always the most seamless, enjoyable experiences <laughs> you've ever had. But imagine how much worse that is if you're 85, or if you can't read, or if you're severely depressed, then having a difficult experience with government isn't just a frustration. It's a real barrier that locks you out of the service and into poverty. Now, I had a vivid illustration of this when I was volunteering in Detroit on a program to redesign the process for applying for food stamps. I was in a rather damp and dingy community center and the strip lights flickering overhead in the eight mile part of Detroit. And I was with a young lady called Monica and she was trying to go into applying for food stamps. Now the process begins with a 42 page long form of mind bending complexity, written in about font size one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it looks like this. Monica was in the fourth hour of trying to fill in this form. And she just reached the question which says, declare all your liquid assets. Failure to do so will result in a penalty. And she looked at me, horror stricken. And she said, uh, well, um, uh, liquid assets. Uh, I I've got some, some milk in the fridge. <laughs> That's funny, right? I mean, it's funny to us because we're safe. Our lives are great. But for Monica, if she didn't fill in this form correctly, that meant she couldn't feed her children. Now, it's not just a problem for the people who use government services if, they don't, if they're not well designed. It's also a problem for the people who are trying to improve them. I had a forceful illustration of this when I was working to try and cut crime in West London. We'd taken the unusual step of going to spend eight days living with a group of addicts who were in and out of prison. This was a really amazing experience for me. One of the things that stood out to me most clearly was their attitude to prison. So I assume prison's bad, right? Prison's bad. Well, they actually seemed to quite like it. And that was puzzling to me. In fact, when we surveyed them, eight out of 10 said, if I could self-refer into prison, I would do that. As in, if I could tick a box saying, oh, I'd like to go to prison now, then that's what they would do. I found this really extraordinary. <laughs> so I said, uh, one of the blokes called Mick, and um, uh, I said to him, could you explain a little bit more to me, Mick, about how this works? He said, yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, it's basically, I like a combination of freedom in my life, just like you do, but I also like structure. And prison gives me structure. So when you're maybe having a few too many donuts, you think, I probably need a personal trainer now. Well, for me, when I've had a few too many drugs, when I've been out on the Raz a bit too much, when I've nicked too much, I think, I need to turn this around. And prison is my personal trainer. <laughs> That's like mind blowing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to design a better service for these guys. And we're trying to work on what would change their behavior. And we're so far off that what we think of as the stick, they think is the carrot. <laughs> I would never have realized that if I hadn't got out of my ivory tower and gone and spent real time with them. Um, so it's not surprising, really, the government gets this stuff wrong. Because when you think about it, the people who run government 
usually have no direct personal experience of the problem that they're trying to solve. Now, that's not to say that they're not well-meaning or hugely intelligent. They're usually both. It's just to say that the people who work on bad schools usually went to great schools. The people who work on aging policy are usually of working age. The people who work on health policy are healthy. And in fact, if you want to work on prison reform, it's an absolute requirement. The first thing we check is that you've never been in prison. <laughs> no? <laughs> um, so um, what do we do instead? Well, we rely on brains. It's good to be intelligent. Brains are helpful. But intelligence is a complement to good government. It's not a substitute for direct experience of the problem. Now, uh, I know of what I speak because I was one of these people. I was a technocrat. After a hot shot job in consulting, a great education, I wanted to go and serve the government. And so I was very excited when on my first day, I got assigned to a team that was working on homelessness. I thought, fantastic, this is such an important issue. So I said, um, when are we going to go and interview some homeless people? And uh, I was a bit surprised when the team said, well, I don't really know about that because we've read a lot of research, we talked to some academics, and we've also been to speak to the people uh, in the homeless charities who do the lobbying on this sort of stuff. So I was like, oh, that's great then, right? Brilliant. But I don't think so, actually, because I used to, I know some of these guys. In fact, I was at Cambridge with them reading classics. You know, they're nice people, <laughs> but they definitely don't have direct personal experience of homelessness. The real experts on homelessness are homeless people. And we weren't going to be speaking to any of them. It's no good being the smartest person in the room if you never actually go into a room with the people you're trying to help. <laughs> so this moment set me searching for a better way of doing government. And I'm pleased to say I found one. And it's actually right here in Silicon Valley. It's to apply the techniques of design thinking, of human-centered design, which we use in the lean startup methodology here, into government. It's not too complicated. Basically, it's taking, spending time with the people who you're trying to help and then co-creating something better with them. Now, when I say design, you're probably thinking of something like this, or this, and that's design. This is design too. What makes Airbnb work is not the pretty colors. It's that they thought really carefully about what would make for a great user experience for you, and they've built something seamless around you. Government should be the same. So when you do this, you get much better results. First, you create a service which actually works. I'm sorry to say that a lot of government services don't really work. They don't solve the problem they set out to try and solve. And people cycle in and out of them over many years. Secondly, it's usually a lot cheaper. You spend time looking carefully at what service people actually want. You can usually cut out a load of stuff that they didn't want and didn't use in the first place. Thirdly, this is inspiring work. Because design connects you directly back to the people you came into public service to help, you get past all that pen pushing and form filling which we associate with government. It really connects you to what you came into public service for in the first place. And finally, it's respectful. This is not respectful. So don't give in to the cynicism about what government can do. It works on crucial topics like ending child poverty, like cutting domestic violence, like building a fairer society. And it does so with a huge ton of cash. We're not talking about 1% of your corporate profits here. We're talking about really channeling trillions of dollars to things that matter. If that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. So what can you do? Well, if you work in government, then I really encourage you to take the time to find out a little bit more about human-centered design and see if you can apply it to your work. It doesn't have to be rocket science. It's just about going and spending some time with the people that you're trying to help in their office, not in yours. And if you don't work in government, well, there's still something you can do. Stop trash talking government. <laughs> Is it perfect? No. Could it be better? Yes. And would it be a lot better if people who are entrepreneurial, who know about design, who know about lean startup, who are bright and talented, people like the people in this room, 
got involved? Absolutely. So, if you want to make your millions in the private sector, great, this is good. But if you want to work on something that really matters, if you want to get up each day with purpose, if you want to build a fairer society, if you want to do the work you were born for, then I encourage you to join me in this fantastic joint endeavor we call government. And together, we can build government by the people, with the people, for the people. Thank you.